Hi, welcome back. In this class, we are going to study further how fluid is conditioned. In that, we will come across new interesting topics like pipes and hoses, heat exchangers and uh, quick release couplings. So, the topics which I am covering today are these pipes, hoses, quick acting coupling, contamination and heat exchanger. So, the overview of my le lecture in today's class will be fluid transmission via pipes and hoses, sources of contamination and how it is controlled, heat exchangers. So, the main objective of this lecture is to study fluid transmission through pipes and hoses, to explore various sources of contamination and how to control them. Overview of heat exchangers employed in fluid power systems. So, to begin with, let us start with pipes and hoses. Oftenly, we get confused that pipes and hoses are same, but uh, practically speaking, they are entirely different. So, in what way they are different, we are going to study. So, in any hydraulic and pneumatic system, the prime motive that is the fluid is going to be transmitted from the source to the receiver. So, through conduits which we call it as pipes and hoses. So, pipes and hoses are the means through which you are going to convey the prime motive that is the working medium from the source to the receiver. The receiver is the application. So, we may require the services of different types of hose and pipes along with fittings. The main objective of this uh, conduits are, they are, they act as the connectivity between the source that is the reservoir to the application and again from the application back to the reservoir. So, these hoses and pipe should be very efficient, leakage proof and they should tolerate high pressures. That is why this uh, while designing the hydraulic and pneumatic circuit, special care should be taken in selecting these hoses and pipes which are standard components. The main difference between the pipes and the hoses is, uh, the hoses are reinforced. So, they are reinforced rubber, made up of rubber, steel and other materials, whereas the pipes are they are not reinforced. The main reason for this is stability and long life. So, if you take the uh, example of the household application, we in LPG cylinder used in the house, earlier we were using green pipes. So, the green pipes which we, we, which we were using had lot of problems. The due to high pressure, the pipe, the green pipe used to bust, sometime leakage was evident. So, in order to overcome those problems, the new Suraksha orange, uh, orange color uh, tubes are used, which are very powerful, strong and they have mild steel reinforcements. So, because of this reinforcement, somewhat these hoses become rigid, they are semi rigids, they become semi rigid and they are very strong, they, the chances of leakage is very less compared to pipes which are more flexible due to absence of reinforcements. The main difference is being the application. So, for industry we use hose pipes and for domestic application we use ordinary pipes.
So, basically uh, the everything uh, boils down to the operating pressure or the working pressure. If the working pressure is tremendous, we go for the oses to prevent pipe bursting and if the working pressure is moderate or less, we go for a normal flexible pipe. Any hydraulic system basically uses four types of conductors or pipes. One is the steel pipe which is very rigid in nature and the length is limited. Second one is steel tubes, steel tubes are hollow tubes which are also having limited length say 20 feet is the standard length available, but they are, they are in available in different shapes, sizes and configurations. Nowadays, the most popular one is plastic tubing which is economical compared to steel and pipes and tubes. So, plastic tubes have a very good finite length. It is available in 100 feet to 75 feet. Next is still better is flexible hoses. Flexible hoses are collapsible type compared to plastic tubing, you can inflate and deflate the flexible hoses. Now, this is the green pipe that is the plastic pipe which we are using, it is the bundle. So, it is having around 100 feet length, running length and it is very flexible. You can easily connect it from the source to the receiver end that is the application. But the main problem with this type of pipe is that it is having limited life and uh, if, uh, the, if the pipe is not maintained properly and if the pressure is given above the standard pressure or the operating pressure, the pipe may burst resulting in leakage of the hydraulic fluid. The second type is flexible pipe, you can see this flexible pipe. So, this flexible, flexible pipe is having a connector and this is totally inflated and you can release all the fluid inside and uh, you can um, keep this inside a storage space compactly and you can use it as and when it required. So, transportation becomes easier and this is more effective in uh, cases in outdoor applications. This is the reinforced type hose pipe uh, which is having steel reinforcement, the mesh is the steel mesh which is reinforced with a normal polymer based. So, this pipe is more rigid in nature and uh, the life of this pipe is more compared to its predecessors. So, this is the rigid pipe, the improvisation better than the collapsible pipe which is uh, having conductors, built in conductors fitted to the pipe itself. So, readily you can connect it to the required destination and supply the fluid with high pressure. So, still somewhat more better options are available in, uh, in the collapsible type uh, hoses. So, this is the steel hoses completely made up of steel having the connector at the end, the threaded connector at the end. So, this is one more PVC type hose pipe made up for duct and water transport. This is of low cost, but the life is very poor. So, after studying about the different types of pipes and hoses, we should know how to connect them to the required application, whether it is how to connect the pipe to the tank or the receiver tank and how to connect it to the application may, which may be a cylinder. So, the best couplant is quick acting couplings. So, couplings are flexible members which are used to connect the pipes to the source that is the uh, tank and to the destination that is the actuator. The main objective of the coupling is we need to effortlessly connect the coupling 
to the uh, components at a faster rate as well as disengage the same at a very faster rate. So, both engaging and disengaging the coupling should be done with ease effortlessly, but at a faster rate. So, these are called as quick acting couplings. So, these components are highly precise components, they are engineered and they are made up of exact dimensions with close tolerances. They are used for variety of applications and sometimes they are called as quick release couplings. So, quick release couplings is one which you can fastly engage and disengage. Sometimes they are popularly known as QCs, quick connect <coughs> in industrial units. So, this is the quick release coupling. So, this is the male part and this is the female part. So, any coupling will be having the male part and the female part for engagements. Couplings can be connected to both hydraulic as well as pneumatic systems. So, they can be connected rapidly and uh, they uh, nowadays what is happening is they are built in the coupling is hot pressed into the pipes and directly you need not connect it to the pipes. Uh, you can buy it ready madely and you can fit it to the system. So, these are the different couplings used right. These are available with different configurations and depending upon the application we can select this uh, coupling and uh, nowadays brass couplings are becoming very popular because brass is of light weight and it is anti corrosive and it can withstand high pressure considerably compared to steel counterparts. This quick change couplings are very fast immediately you can connect the pipes to wherever you want whether you want to connect it to the cylinder whether you want to connect it to the direction control valve whether you want to connect it to the source tank. So, whichever is the destination at a very faster rate this quick couplings can be connected. One of the important interesting thing about this quick coupling is that it require requires minimum tools as well as less skilled operator can do the job. So, this enables rapid connectivity and disengagement between the terminals. So, the most popular is the threaded type coupling which requires spanner for connecting. So, some of the variants of couplings are you can see this male pipe threaded, female pipe threaded variant, hose and barb with locking sleeve. So, this is the male part. So, the male part will engage with the female part. So, you can see the different variation male pipe thread with locking sleeve, female pipe thread with locking sleeve male head hose pipe, female head hose pipe, male head and male NPT end, female head and male NPT end, male head and female NPT end. So, you can get this in pairs, you will not get individually because individually the component if you buy it is useless. You should have both male and female part, one end of the coupling should be connected to the male part, the other end of the pipe should be connected to the female part. So, we have locking head. So, in order to prevent mechanical separation of couplings, we have locking heads and to prevent the leakage from this coupling, we require gaskets. So, you can enclose the coupling inside a casing called as lock converters. 
this sketch, this image will give you the overview of different types of coupling used in pneumatic and hydraulic systems. Now, after studying important things about the components of hydraulic and pneumatic systems like strainers, filters, quick acting couplings and as well as the pipes and hoses. Now, we move on to a very important phenomenon which is unwarranted, this is called as contamination. Now, in today's world, it is very difficult to prevent contamination, no matter how much you guarantee that the system is free from dust particles, oil, grease, somehow or the other, somehow or the other, what happens is the pure hydraulic substance will come, pure, pure hydraulic fluid will come into contact with some or the other types of contaminations. So, we need to study and explore the different types of contaminants, so that we can properly control them. So, some of the sources of contamination are contaminants, contaminants left in the system during assembly and subsequent maintenance work. So, this is very important, often we find that the technician or the operator who repairs or the maintenance personnel who maintains the hydraulic and pneumatic system, once he does the maintenance action, he forgets to re remove or clean the leftover parts or the leftover dust particles in the system itself. So, as a result, once the fluid is circulated, it is washed away and it gets clogged and the particles, uh, the particles get trapped in the pump and other filters and the efficiency of the system will come down. So, this is due to the ignorance or it is due to the carelessness of the operator or the maintenance personnel, this type of contamination occurs. So, the second type of second reason for contamination to occur is creation of wear particles, wear debris. You know that wear occurs when harder surfaces slides over smoother surfaces. The harder surface tends to plow and remove material from the softer sur surfaces and the material removed is called as wear debris. These wear debris are created due to improper lubrication. So, these wear debris are again present in the flowing hydraulic fluid and they are circulated among the downstream, uh, downstream devices like pumps, direction control valves, etcetera and they are what causing the damages to the moving parts of such active components. Also sometimes due to oxidation, uh, metallic oxides or metallic salts are formed, they also get mixed with the flowing hydraulic fluid and the hydraulic fluid gets impured and this gets reacted with the walls of the inner walls of the pipe and rust and other phenomena, unwarranted phenomena are initiated. Sometimes contaminants are introduced externally into the system, knowingly, unknowingly due to some maintenance action. So, even though you have ensured that the system is leak tight, leak proof, due to some maintenance action, what happens is due to inspection or any other process, the contaminants get into the system. If you have opened the lid of the reservoir for a longer period of time and you have forgotten to close it, so again dust particles enter into the system and they also create lot of problems. So, that is to be avoided. So, these dust particles need to be filtered before entering into the subsequent stages. Now, let us move on to some of the problems caused by contamination if unattended. It accelerates 
component wear. As I told you that in the previous discussion that if the contaminants contain dust particles like wear debris which are harder which acts as an abrasive and they tend to scratch the impellers of the pump or the valves surface which are smoothly polished and the material is removed. So, it results in pitting failure or corrosive failure. So, this needs to be prevented. So, better to install filters in the suction pipeline itself so that subsequently the output from the filters is nothing but filtered hydronymic, hydro, hydraulic fluid which is free from all the contaminants enter into the downstream components like pump actuators and direction control valves, flow control valves. As a result what happens? The performance of the system will come down, the service life of the components will come down, frequently we need to maintain the system. Also it results in sluggish operation. Sometimes a small particle gets trapped in the rotating pump and the pump will starts functioning, it stops functioning and you have to open the pump, remove the trapped particle and again you have to put that in place and the system has to start work. So, this consumes lot of time and this is unwarranted in critical applications. Sometimes these uh, uh, particles they flow over gasket and seals which are used to prevent the uh, leakage or other uh, phenomenon or uh, lateral end leakages. So, what will happen is the seals will rupture and uh, the, fluid will, the fluid will starts leaking. So, this needs to be prevented. So, better to avoid this by filtering out the contaminants. The next objective is contamination control. There are many ways to reduce the effect of contaminants in the system. One such is we need to plumb the system in such a way that while fitting the pipe with other units, we have to make sure that it is free from rust, scale, dirt or any other foreign material. Second, after fitting the new components, better to flush out all the system by passing fluid. So, if you pass the fluid and you flush out all the particles entrapped in the system by opening at one end, you can see that all the entrapped particles are ejected out and you have to do it one or two, three times to make sure that no particles are left over inside the system. So, this is done by the maintenance staff who will see that all the particles are what free from the dust and any other contaminants. They say that prevention is better than cure. So, better to install a line filter in the upstream uh, process itself so that the line filter will take care of all the contaminants, trap them and uh, you can uh, periodically maintain that filter so that the downstream components are not affected by this contaminants at all. Sometimes we come to the conclusion that if we are using an hydraulic system, the contaminants will be supplied by the hydraulic fluid itself and if you are using a pneumatic system, the contaminants may get into contact from the air itself. 
So, we need to use appropriate filters and strainers to block these contaminants. One of the important thing about the contamination is we need to frequently clean the filters. We need to frequently clean the filters. So, one of the elements, fiber elements which are used to routinely clean the filters. So, periodically we need to clean the filters so that they are functioning properly and effectively. One way of cleaning the filter is washing it using kerosene or any other solvents. The other system involved is to provide a good safety enclosures so that no mechanical damage occurs to this filter. So, clean and replace the filter on routine basis. It is recommended that the viscosity as well as the pH value of the fluid should be maintained at neutral level, because this results in uh, proper functioning of the fluid and no acidic or basic reaction occurs. So, the next topic which is very important is heat exchanger. So, we require the services of heat exchanger for many purposes, namely in pneumatic and hydraulic system it is, it is used for preheating the air. So, preheating ensures to uh, eliminate the moisture in the incoming fluid, whether it is an hydraulic fluid or air, if you preheat what will happen is the moisture is eliminated. So, we require heat exchangers. So, in heat exchangers, heat addition or heat rejection takes place. So, wherever possible if heat is removed from the system that is called as condenser heat exchanger and if we add the heat to the system it is called as evaporator heat exchanger. So, heat exchangers are available nowadays compactly arranged, we can be fitted readily in the supply line of the hydraulic fluids and uh, they enhance the efficiency of the system. The always heat is need to be removed from the system, sometimes heat need to be added to the system. So, both condensers and evaporators can accomplish this task respectively. Sometimes due to overheating what happens is the heat remains dissipated, undissipated as a result the system gets overheated, the working substance that is the hydraulic fluid will get boiled and it yields in a lot of complications. So, we need to remove the heat as fast as possible. So, we can use heat exchangers like evaporators which will remove the heat from the system at a very faster rate. So, this is the evaporator which is fitted on the pipeline that is continuously removing the heat from the system. Sometimes what happens is we do not know at what context we are using the heat exchanger in the uh, what uh, hydraulic and pneumatic system. Basically, we call heat exchangers as cool, coolers. So, coolers are basically heat removing devices. There is lot of difference between coolers and condensers. Coolers are shorter in size, compact, where our condensers are bigger in size and large. In some application, heat need to be added to the fluid to give a better performance or better satisfaction result. So, that is called as heat additions. So, sometimes we require heater. 
So, cooler is also required, heater is also required. So, heater is uh, supply, heater is fitted to the receiver tank so that it eats the uh, fluid to a certain temperature so that the viscosity and other parameters are refined and the flow occurs smoothly. So, both coolers and heat exchangers are employed in the hydraulic and pneumatic system to increase the efficiency of flow. Basically, there are two types of heat exchangers. The one is air cooled heat exchanger, which mainly depends upon air as the working medium. Next is water cooled heat exchanger, the main working medium is water, but air cooled and water cooled both can be naturally circulation as well as artificially circulation or what we call it as forced circulation. Natural circulation occurs due to the density difference among the fluid, whereas for force circulation we require the external pumping agencies. So, water nowadays is used extensively to dissipate the heat, water jackets are mounted on the hydraulic cylinder, they continuously uh, dissipate the heat to a tunes of 3 degree to 5 degree range. Water coolers are preferred compared to air coolers because air coolers sometimes they are not as effective as water coolers because the surface area are not continuously exposed to the air. So, we need to bring change in the shape in the form of fins. So, then only air coolers are effective. So, water coolers are preferred over air coolers. Now, you can see different types of heat exchangers used in hydraulic and pneumatic system. The basic type is the depending upon the type of flow that is parallel flow and counter flow. So, this is the parallel flow. In this parallel flow, what happens is the, the flow of the cooling coolant is parallel to the flow of air. So, if the, this is the uh, what the diagram schematic diagram of the parallel flow configuration. So, in parallel flow configuration both the fluids the air and the coolant they are flowing parallel to, to one another. Whereas, in counter flow the reverse direction takes place on one side air is flowing on the opposite side the coolant is flowing. Right. So, both are available depending upon the application, but it is found that counter flow are more effective compared to parallel flow. Another type of uh, heat exchanger is shell type. So, this shell type heat exchanger is used which, conti, cons, conti, conti, which consists of a pipe in the form of shell and another one is baffle plate which is uses the what the shell to the in place of tubes. So, this uh, type of uh, uh, heat exchanger is used for power plants or any other steam generation units where we, uh, huge quantity of fluid is handled. Moving on, we have different configurations of shell type heat exchangers. You can see the different configuration. Some are straight, cylindrical, some are tapered, right, and uh, they some are shell type and some are tube type. Basically, we have shell type heat exchanger and tube type heat, heat exchanger. The shell type is closed and uh, tube type is opened at the one end. So, we name that as different types. For example, this is AKT version, BEM version, CFU version, 
AES version. So, different versions are available for different applications. We can use this heat exchanger for a particular application and uh, we can what uh, enhance the performance of any hydraulic and pneumatic system by preheating the incoming fluids, whether it is air or whether it is a fluid. After completely explaining heat exchanger and its type, now it is time to watch videos. Now you can first up you can watch a video on the different types of hoses and pipe configuration. After that you are going to watch a video on the quick release couplings and the last and not the least you are going to watch a video on the heat exchangers. All these three videos are very informative which will enhance your knowledge. In order to enhance the teaching learning process as an add on I have taken videos from YouTube channel for which I acknowledge the same. Thank you.
in this video about types of heat exchangers. The most commonly used heat exchangers are shell and tube heat exchanger, air cooled heat exchanger, plate type heat exchanger, spiral heat exchanger, and double pipe heat exchanger. Shell and tube heat exchanger. A yeah, shell and tube heat exchanger is a class of heat exchangers design. One fluid runs through the tubes and another fluid flows over the tube to transfer heat between the two fluids. Air cooled heat exchanger. Air cooled heat exchangers, also known as fin fan heat exchangers are typically used in applications where water is not available or the desired process outlet temperature can be achieved given the maximum ambient temperatures. Air cooled heat exchangers are used in a wide variety of applications. Plate heat exchanger a plate heat exchanger is a type of heat exchanger that uses metal plates to transfer heat between two fluids. This has a major advantage over a conventional heat exchanger in that the fluid are exposed to much larger surface area because the fluids are spread out over the plates. Spiral Heat Exchanger The spiral plate heat exchanger is made by rolling two long metal plates around a center core to form two concentric spiral flow passages, one for each fluid. The plate edges are welded shut so that each flow stays within its own passage and there is no flow by passing or intermixing. Double pipe heat exchangers. The double pipe heat exchanger, also known as concentric pipe, have been jacket pipe and jacketed tube tube heat exchangers. Consists of a single tube mounted inside another. One fluid flows in the inner pipe, while a second fluid flows in the outer pipe annuals. Finally, we come to the uh, summary that is the recap of what we thought in today's class. In today's class, we came to know how to improve the quality of incoming hydraulic fluid into the typical fluid power systems using elimination of contaminants by filters and strainers. How to transmit fluid in pipes and hoses. To identify different sources of contamination and how to eliminate them. Different configuration of heat exchangers employed in fluid power system to enhance the efficiency of the process. So, after this summary, the finally is the outcome of this lecture. So, out the outcome of the lecture is the student will be able to after the completion of this course, the student will be able to understand the different configurations of hoses and pipes commercially available. The second object outcome is or the takeaway is you will able to identify different types of contamination, the reason behind them and how to control them. And Finally, you have the different types of heat exchangers which are employed and how to select an appropriate heat exchanger for a particular application for an hydraulic pneumatic system. So, this chapter is very important, it, it co covers 
all the downstream components of a typical hydraulic pneumatic system. So, so far we have studied the downstream components like the hose pipes, the quick acting couplings, the heat exchangers. The next is the pumps which are going to study in the next class, both pumps and actuators which are going to study in the next class. Thank you.